It is 9.01, so I think we'll get um, started here. Thanks for coming, everyone. Welcome to the Lake Association Summit um, for 2024. I'm Heather Huffstetler. I'm the Executive Director here at the Watershed Council. Um, and we're excited to have a really great panel um, of presenters, experts, um, and lake and watershed enthusiasts um, to join us uh, for the summit as we explore our watershed neighbors. Um, so we're gonna kick it off with the Watershed Council's own water resources manager, Marcella Donka, who's gonna get us rolling talking about water quality in Northern Michigan. So Marcella, take it away. Hi, good morning, everybody. I will go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, Kala, are you just seeing the the main view, not the presenter view? Yep, it looks perfect. Okay, great. I'll go ahead and get started. Um, good morning, everyone. As Heather said, my name is Marcelo Donka. I am the Water Resources Manager here at Tip of the Mitt Watershed Council, and I've been here since about May of 2023, um, and I will be speaking about Northern Michigan's water quality, uh, the state of our, our waters that we monitor and oversee, um, and the impact on our watershed neighbors, which is the theme of our Lake Association Summit today. Um, so without further ado, I will go ahead and get started and I'm happy to take any questions at the end. So just to give a brief introduction to the Watershed Council, this won't take more than a few minutes. Um, Tip of the Mitt Watershed Council, we are an environmental nonprofit located in Petoskey, Michigan, and our mission is to speak for Northern Michigan's waters. Um, so we're dedicated to protecting our lakes, streams, wetlands, and groundwater through a variety of different programs and departments. Uh, these include policy and advocacy, our education programs, our monitoring and research, and our restoration efforts as well. And our service area, um, which is kind of what I'll be focusing on today, the different watersheds within our service area, um, covers much of northern Michigan. So we focus on protecting the water resources uh, primarily in Charlevoix, Emmett, Antrim, and Sheboygan counties. And um, that is what I'll be, I'll be focusing on. So getting right into sort of the crux of our presentation, um, we have several water quality monitoring programs here at the Watershed Council, uh, many of which I oversee as water resources manager, and I work closely with our monitoring coordinator who completes um, the majority of this monitoring alongside our volunteers as well. So our very first monitoring program is CWQM or Comprehensive Water Quality Monitoring. And this takes place um, annually after ice out in the spring. And this program focuses on major lakes and rivers in our service area. And lately it has been, well, as of last year, it's been done on a rotational watershed basis. So that means of the five watersheds that we focus on, um, and many of these watersheds include smaller watersheds and sub watersheds, but the five um, sort of top level watersheds, those are done on a rotational basis. So um, each one is monitored every three years. So for example, this past year, we focused on um, our Little Traverse Bay watershed and our Charlevoix watershed. And this upcoming year, 2025, we will be looking at our Sheboygan River watershed, which is many different rivers and streams and lakes as well. Um, so the Comprehensive Water Quality Monitoring Program, I'll talk a little bit more about different um, indicators and what parameters that program looks for, but just um, sort of as a top level introduction, we look at uh, nutrients like phosphorus and nitrogen, we look at chloride, and we look at physical parameters such as specific conductivity, temperature, depth, dissolved oxygen. So I will get a little bit more into those in a few slides. Um, our Volunteer Lake Monitoring Program, or VLM, is exactly how it sounds. That is conducted 
um, primarily by volunteers. So this is a lake specific program that is done on an annual basis um, with hundreds of chlorophyll A samples and secchi depth readings um, coming from it each year. So the two kind of primary parameters that we focus on there are water clarity readings or secchi depth um, as well as chlorophyll A. And we really try and get um, an overall look at the biological productivity of the lake. And this is conducted annually, as I said, um, from June through August. So there is a, a specific schedule and protocols that volunteers follow for that. And our last major water quality monitoring program is VSM, or our Volunteer Stream Monitoring Program. And that is done annually in the spring and fall. And that focuses on um, rivers and streams that are weightable and able to be collected or able to be looked at for macroinvertebrate diversity. Um, and macroinvertebrate samples. So macroinvertebrates, for anyone that is unfamiliar, those are small um, aquatic insects that can be seen with the naked eye, and they are excellent bioindicators of uh, pollution and overall water quality. So I said I would talk a little bit more about water quality indicators. Um, so I mentioned several of these nutrients, trophic status indicators, macros, physical parameters, and chloride. Um, so when we first think about nutrients, which are primarily monitored through CWQM, um, we look at total phosphorus and total nitrogen, and these are essential aquatic nutrients that can indicate the health of an ecosystem um, and the level of pollution occurring within a river, lake, or stream. Trophic status indicators, on the other hand, um, those include chlorophyll A and secchi depth, which is a measure of water clarity. Um, and together, these two can help us understand the overall trophic status of a water body. So um, you may have heard the terms oligotrophic, mesotrophic, eutrophic, hypereutrophic. Um, those are all referring to the state of biological productivity. So how much algae, how much growth we have, um, how much food is available to larger organisms. So overall, how, how productive that lake, river, or stream is. Uh, macroinvertebrates. I introduced those a bit in the last slide, but those again function as bioindicators um, for, in our case, river and stream health. And macros, there's you know a huge, huge different or a huge, a sheer amount of diversity for macros, and they range from um, very pollution tolerant to highly sensitive. So when we collect these and identify them down to the family level we are able to tell um, quite a bit about the health of that river and stream and um, understand the level of pollution that may be occurring in that water body. Uh, physical parameters, so a lot of these are collected with our um, water quality monitoring equipment or our, our multi-parameter probes, and these include temperature, specific conductivity, um, a chemical parameter would include dissolved oxygen, and these are critical characteristics that indicate the environmental um, overall suitability for wildlife and um, different chemical processes that are occurring within these water bodies. So, you know, the theme of today is our watershed neighbors, um, specific parameters such as temperature, specific conductivity, dissolved oxygen, those are all critical for the success of wildlife. And the final um, parameter there I have is chloride on the far right. Um, so this is a crucial indicator of stormwater runoff, uh, human-induced pollution from road salting, brining, uh, stormwater effluent, and chloride can be toxic to wildlife in high amounts. So we do monitor that as part of our uh, comprehensive water quality monitoring program and through some um, contractual projects as well. So we've talked about our monitoring programs and the different indicators that we look at, but we need to understand why this data matters, both at a um, human impact level as well as a wildlife impact level. So we'll start with human impact and then we'll make the segue into wildlife. Um, so I'm sure many of us are you know, familiar with the, the sheer importance of clean water resources, um, but they have an impact on our everyday life in many ways. So um, there are several ways that this, this data can um, help us as humans that, that use our water resources on a daily basis. Just a few of those reasons would be drinking water and ensuring the availability of clean water resources for all. Um, agriculture, so that connects to food and use of everyday products, cosmetics, um, just, just products we can go to the store and, and pick out at any time. 
Uh, recreation and tourism. Uh, so this, this connects directly to economic viability, the enjoyment of nature, um, and keeping those recreation and, and tourism economies flourishing and thriving. And ecosystem services, I just named a few of, of countless ecosystem services that clean water provides, but uh, filtration, nutrient cycling, erosion prevention and stability, mitigation of extreme weather events, and, and so many more. So these are just things, again, I'm sure we're all familiar with, but um, our water resources are, are critical for our success as humans. And making that connection into why this data matters for wildlife and bringing up the concept of our watershed neighbors. Well, our, our freshwaters are teeming with wildlife, right? We have such a sheer diversity of life um, in our lakes, rivers, and streams. And looking at this data that we collect at the Watershed Council, whether it's collected by staff or our wonderful volunteers, um, this can help us to understand different levels of pollution, nutrient influx. Um, you can see that har harmful algal bloom pictured on the right there. Um, that has a lot to do with uh, nitrogen and phosphorus input. I've pictured a food web there at the bottom, so this data can help us to understand a bit more about food availability, productivity of a system, and how that's going to um, affect the food chain, whether it's from you know algae and zooplankton all the way up to large fish or um, predators in our in our watersheds. And then finally, we look at this data to determine the stability of overall aquatic environments and their ability to support a variety of species and maintain the diversity um, of our freshwater resources. So when I was discussing dissolved oxygen, temperature, conductivity, um, those are all, again, critical indicators that, that tell us how well a water body is able to support life. Okay, so getting a bit into some of the water quality challenges in our service area and, and challenges that the water resources of Northern Michigan face. Um, we like to emphasize at the Watershed Council that Northern Michigan's water resources are high quality, but they are not immune to water quality challenges. And they remain susceptible to um, many different areas that, that water resources are facing on a, a global scale. So just a few of these would include uh, non-point source pollution, agriculture and urbanization, invasive species and recreational issues, as well as climate change. So with non-point source pollution, that includes different factors like nutrient influx, uh, microplastic contamination, pesticides, oil and gas runoff, excess road salts in the form of chloride. With agriculture and urbanization, um, and we look at increasing development, loss of habitat, use of fertilizers and pesticides again. Invasive species and um, recreational issues would include transfer of invasive plants and animals through uh, watercraft and erosion, sedimentation, and increased impact from wake boats. And then sort of the big one here, climate change, we see changing water temperatures, changing water levels, and decreased ice coverage if we have um, a lot of Northern Michigan locals on this Zoom call today, uh, you'll know that we had a very mild winter and we did not see freezing of most of our lakes. So um, definitely things to keep in mind here when we consider Northern Michigan's water quality challenges. So just a very brief overview of the kind of overall state of our watersheds. So the five primary watersheds that we focus on. Um, those include the Charlotte, the Lake Charlevoix watershed, the Little Traverse Bay watershed, the Sheboygan River watershed, the Elk River chain of lakes, and we have a um, other fifth watershed that we consider coastal slash other, um, and so that includes just um, Great Lakes and then others that are not directly falling into these previous four watersheds. Um, so to kind of talk about the state of each of these watersheds, and this is going to be a brief overview um, because there are numerous rivers, lakes, and streams within each one. Um, I do want to emphasize again that these, these resources are high quality, um, but that these water resources are not immune to these impacts that I have included on the bottom here. Um, and these are a bit different and some are uh, similar from the previous slide, but um, when we think about issues like eutrophication, um, 
chloride and specific conductivity, uh, nutrient influx and macroinvertebrate diversity. These are all um, issues that we see within each of these watersheds. So for example, in the Lake Charlevoix watershed, um, of all the water bodies monitored within that watershed, we've seen um, a couple issues with water clarity, right? So um, very low secchi depths. Uh, we've seen issues with nutrient exceedances, low macroinvertebrate diversity. Um, in Little Traverse Bay, we've seen many of the same issues, right? So water clarity, nutrient exceedances, um, a couple instances of very high specific conductivity, which can often be indicative of pollution issues, um, and a couple water bodies with high chloride levels as well. Um, in the Sheboygan River watershed, we have seen, again, nutrient exceedances, water clarity, and chlorophyll A um, readings that would indicate eutrophic water bodies, and um, a couple sites with lower macroinvertebrate diversity. So we, when we collect our macroinvertebrates through our volunteer stream monitoring program, we assign um, eventually a grade to each of those water bodies. And um, when I say low macro diversity, that usually means uh, the water body got a rating of a C or a D on our scale, um, A being the best, and I think E is the worst. And then um, with the Elk River chain of lakes, again, many of these same issues, nutrient exceedances, um, low water clarity, and um, some higher levels of specific conductivity. And then in our coastal watershed, um, nutrient exceedances and low water clarity. So many of these issues are occurring across all of our watersheds and watersheds globally. Um, and again, these, these are very high quality resources that um, we are aiming to protect and preserve, but it does not mean that they are not experiencing um, issues from human impact and pollution. So I wanted to take a very quick segue here um, and I might, Kala, do you want me to pull up um, the, like our actual website here? Um, I'll put a link to it in the chat. Okay, that would be great. Um, that's much easier, yes. So a little segue since I've been talking so much about our water quality monitoring programs and all of the data that we collect. Um, this data is completely free and publicly accessible via our website. So Kala is going to put a link to our website in the um, chat that you should all be able to see. And essentially what you can do is if you go to the search bar or if you go to our Inland Lakes page, and I'm happy to walk anybody through it if, um, if anyone needs help with that, then you can select any of your um, lakes, rivers, streams that you are interested in viewing that water quality data for. And you can click on um, the different maps that we have available that show those monitoring sites. And you can go through tabs at the bottom that show um, all of our historical data over time. So many of our water bodies have been monitored since 1987 um, to present day. So you'd be able to click through here on the bottom between temperature, conductivity, chloride, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, chlorophyll A, basically any of the um, water quality parameters that I mentioned, that data is available on our website. Um, so I am happy to do a walkthrough at a later time or, or anybody can contact me and I'm, I'm able to help with that. Okay, so we're getting near the end here and um, I'm going to kind of provide a segue into our, our coming presentations. So this slide discusses how you can be a good watershed neighbor. So I've talked about some water quality issues that uh, many of our watersheds are facing. So just a few ideas for um, ways that you as maybe a riparian owner or um, just someone who is invested in the care of our water quality resources. These, these are different ideas for um, how you can maintain your watershed and be a good watershed neighbor. So um, the first thing here on the top left, green belts and rain gardens. Uh, so these are both tools that can stabilize the shoreline, um, absorb excess nutrients, filter pollutants, attract pollinators, deter geese, and increase the aesthetic value of your property. So I have a rain garden pictured um, in the bottom left here. So um, I, 
can certainly answer any questions about that at the end of this presentation. And we have our restoration manager on call here, um, who is our, our kind of expert in green belt and rain garden installation. Um, in general, as a consumer or a riparian landowner, um, you can think about your everyday actions and how you can reduce your nutrient and waste input into our watersheds. Um, so limit, limiting fertilizer application, limiting phosphorus-based products, um, picking up after cuts and disposing of your waste properly, recycling and limiting the amount of um, plastic and eventual microplastic breakdown that will enter our waters, and then just having and practicing mindful consumption habits. So avoiding buying um, new, you know, maybe buying used and avoiding buying single use items as well. Um, move my panel here. So septic system maintenance um, on the top right over here. So this is a very popular topic here um, in Northern Michigan as we, as we are the only state without a, um, what am I trying to say? Without a septic, a statewide septic code that um, calls for uh, specific installation and maintenance guidelines. So um, as a riparian landowner or as someone who has a septic system, um, it is helpful to understand how your septic system functions. And we have many resources for this on our website. Um, practice regular inspection and have your septic system pumped regularly every three to five years. Keeping an eye out for lush grasses, flooding, or toilet backup. Um, those are all signs of a malfunctioning septic system that may be uh, producing excess nutrients or waste into your yard or drain field. Um, and protecting your drain field in general, so no livestock or cars on the drain field and um, making sure that that is well maintained. And then finally, with invasive species prevention, um, we like to emphasize CD3, clean, dra drain, dry, and dispose. So um, being mindful of what you're transporting with your watercraft, following all guidelines um, for cleaning and preventing the spread of invasive species. Uh, be mindful of signage that, you know, is that maybe the local water body that you um, take your boat out on and uh, boat washing stations, which are present at many of our um, lakes up here. And don't let it loose. Oh, yeah. And then if um, if there are any exotic pets or any animals that, you know, folks have that they no longer want. We don't want to let those loose into the wild. We want to uh, prevent the spread of invasive species and species that are not native to this area. And then just the last one is um, keeping yourself informed and staying educated. We all value our precious water resources, so we need your help to maintain our high quality rivers, lakes, streams, and wetlands. Um, so the best thing that you can do is to stay informed, ask questions, and um, be a good steward of your water resources. Okay, I think that's all I have for you all today. Um, I'm happy to take any questions before we move into the next presentation. Thanks, Marcella. Um, yeah. There were a couple of questions that um, came up in the Q&A. <laughs> Mostly, uh, there were a couple of questions about whether um, these presentations are going to be available afterwards. And okay. The answer to that is yes, this whole webinar is being recorded. And so um, so that will be, those will be available. Um, Kala, maybe you chime in and tell us how. Yeah, sure. So after uh, the webinar in a couple of days, everyone who registered and attended will receive an email and that email will have a link to the recording. Thanks. Um, and then there was another question about, um, what about the Burt Lake watershed? And so I thought, Marcella, you can explain how um, some inland lakes fall within larger watersheds. Um, yeah. Sort of thing. And then um, we also can put up a link to the sort of our region's watershed map also. So folks can take a look at that. Yeah, Kyle, if you could provide a link um, to that helpful map that Emily has on our website. I believe that would be great. Um, yeah, so as I briefly mentioned, those are our five um, sort of top-down level watersheds. So we have many watersheds within those watersheds and then sub-watersheds within those. So we do look at individual watersheds. We say like the Mullet Lake watershed, the Burt Lake watershed, but those are part of the Sheboygan River watershed as a larger whole. Um, so those those water resources are monitored closely and, and looked at closely, and we have data for um, Burt Lake and many of those water bodies within the Burt Lake watershed on our website, um, but we do not 
the Burt Lake watershed is not one of the five um, top down watersheds. I don't know quite what I'm trying to say there, but it is monitored and um, and that is that's part of our service area. So um, when you hear us talk about watershed management plans, those management plans, um, so that would be part of sort of a, a Sheboygan River watershed management plan if we because we would go to sort of the largest um, watershed that um, that basically the EPA manages our watersheds on sort of a larger um, level, if that helps to make sense. Mm -hmm. You guys can ask more questions um, in the Q&A too, if, if you need more details. <laughs> Um, I think those were the large one. Those were the main questions. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so wait, there's one more there. Sorry. Um, is there legislature pending with the state of Michigan regarding septics? I feel like that question was a plant. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm not a policy expert or anything, but I know that is there's pending legislature, but nothing has been passed. Maybe someone that knows a little bit more about that could yeah. chime in, but yeah, I'll I'll chime in a little bit. There is um there is a bill that is being um discussed. It has not yet been introduced uh to a committee. So there is a bill that has been, it's on like version eight or nine right now. Um so um so it is being discussed and um we tip of the mid watershed council along with lots of other organizations um sort of being led by the Michigan Environmental Council um, is working with a set of legislators and those legislators staff um, to develop uh, that. It's sort of a set of bills um, that, you know, meets a lot of different, um, a lot of different public needs. Um, and so there, you know, obviously there are a lot of different, um, you know, sort of users, um, who have their hands in that legislation. So we are hoping that, um, that something gets introduced and indeed passed um, during this uh, lame duck session, which is the last sort of few months um, of the year. Uh, some people are um, optimistic, some people are less optimistic. So you take your pick, depending on where you feel about how you feel about lame duck sessions and their um, productivity. Um, but we are still working hard on um, on that legislation when something is introduced and when we have something to ask you to help us support we you will hear from us and um, and we will be sort of hitting the ground running um, working on getting that legislation you know passed asking you to talk to your area legislators um, to put that to put that legislation into work because we do need we do need something on the books here. And there's another question about water quality and septic systems. I am not sure exactly um, what we're looking for there. There are, the like I said, the slides um, and presentations will be shared if you need more um, details or have a more detailed question um, to submit, please do that, Sue. So um, we wanna move on now to um, Chris Dye, who is um, the Little Traverse Bay uh, Fisheries Manager. And he is going to talk to us about Great Lakes fishes. So we're excited about that. Chris, take it away. Hopefully you guys can hear me. Yes. Love awesome. I'm going to try to share my screen. Look at that. It has been shared. All right. So my name is Chris Dye. I'm here to talk about um, water quality and like impacts on uh, Lake Whitefish. I chose to just narrow it down to one species, just to kind of uh, make it a little easier to go at. Um, but if you don't know, I work for the Little Traverse Bay Bands of Dow Indians, and we have a fish hatchery, or we'll sometimes we'll call it the fisheries enhancement facility. Um, yeah, and I think I'll go through real quick some background stuff so that people are all on the same page, kind of get an idea of where we're coming at uh, with all this. Uh, so if you don't know, Little Traverse Bay Bands has a main government center over on Pleasant View and Hathaway. Uh, our, most of our natural resource department is over there. I am not. I actually work at the fish hatchery, which uh, we're north of the Levering, or I'm sorry, south of Levering, but north of the Pelston Airport. Um, we got some outdoor rearing ponds. We have a little building. We just built a pole barn. Uh, we're fairly new. Uh, we just opened in 2013. 
we were very empty then back then uh, we only had sturgeon in the building that first summer but since then we've kind of worked on trying to address a few things with like cisco's and whitefish uh, in 2020 we opened up a, a bigger central part of our building uh, we started reusing our water so our water is basically recycled and a lot of times we either have no output of water or maybe like a garden hose worth of water coming out uh, in 2024 this is what it looks like so she's very filled up since uh, 2013 we've got all sorts of new replicated racks and larval culture systems and grow out areas and barn um, and so we're really 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 busy all the time there's only three people that work here full time year round and then I have two seasonals that uh, come in now we try to focus on four different things at our hatchery so if you're wondering why talking about research projects and stuff unlike a maybe a normal hatchery that might do a lot of stocking just to stock or you know maybe they're trying to get somebody to catch more fish ours comes down to like research restoration education preservation so preservation would be like uh supplemental stocking a walleye to provide maybe like a fishing opportunity for someone somewhere education so that'd be like our presentations that we do uh, but the main one is normally our search in the classroom so we're reaching out to uh, younger communities there. Uh, restoration activities like Lake Sturgeon, Stocking and Burt Lake in the Sturgeon River, um, and then also our whitefish in the bay. Now, 90% of my time is actually spent on research projects, and so we'll get into a few of those in a couple minutes. Uh, but right now, I think we got 19 ongoing research projects. I want to say eight, 17 or 18 of them are on whitefish. So we're really, really focused on whitefish, and I'll get into why that is here in a minute. But um, it's partly why I chose to go with this, because we have a lot of projects I could probably cover for this. Um, but yeah, whitefish, if you don't, you guys shouldn't have a picture in your head of maybe not just the filet on your plate, but what they look like out in the wild. Um, a lot of ways that we look at, like historically, what were things like, is we look at commercial fishing rec records. And so this is just a plot of commercial fishing, I mean, a long time ago, but this would be like, everything since the European settlement, right? So there were fishing, you know, for the last 10,000 years, but the market style fishing that started um, a lot of times too, before 1917, the uh, data was either written down on a napkin or something, it got thrown away. So there's a lot of missing data points prior to 1917. So if you're thinking that like, oh, maybe we didn't harvest that much, it's actually the data, we just lost it. Uh, we estimate it's right around 10 million pounds. Oh, and my scale bars on these are a little messed up. The way that they these people like to present it is like 30,000 thousand pounds, so 30 million pounds. Um, but yeah, if you look at the plot, <clears throat> you can kind of see that whitefish really declined in the 1950s into the 60s. Um, that I think should correlate with the sea lamprey invasion. Uh, since then, we've done quite a bit of work on on trying to limit the impact of sea lamprey. Um, and then you'll see a really big spike at the end of this graph. Now, this graph ends in 2006. The next one I have will be a little bit farther in time. But yeah, you see a nice big peak. And really, we might have been in the 1990s at some of the largest whitefish populations that maybe the Great Lakes have seen. Uh, we're not entirely certain what it was like prior to Europeans, but it's looking like they they were doing really, really well in the 1990s. So if we just bump that graph over a little bit, I took away the colors because the lakes don't really matter, but all in all, you can kind of see this bell, this little curve, bell curve at the end here. Um, and that's true. We are seeing, we saw a very steep rise of, of whitefish in like the 80s and 90s, and we're seeing a, a, a fall ever since probably 96. Um, and it's even more significant depending on where you go. So like Lake Superior, which might be included in this, hasn't really seen that big of a collapse. Um, in like Green Bay, hasn't really seen that much of a collapse. Uh, but everywhere else, it's really, really bad. And so those, even those two things being leveled out, it is going down. Um, so we're not seeing any babies recruit. It's one of the things that probably Little Traverse Bay we haven't seen babies really recruit to be adults. So they have eggs, they have little babies. We do see them in the springtime. 
and then we never see him again after July. Um, and that's been going on since 2003 for us uh, here in our area. We don't necessarily know why. We have a few ideas, and I'll get into those in a minute. But this little plot here kind of shows they try to equalize the amount of babies being produced based on how big the, the female is. So like one fish being produced per kilo of fish, it's kind of your baseline there. But you can see in the early 90s, really high. It kind of slowly declines, especially around the mid 90s and really a lot around 2003, which is when we saw uh, recruitment basically collapse. Um, so recruitment's going down. We're not making as many babies nowadays. Uh, if you even look at like the growth of those fish during this pe same period of time, um, you can break it down from prior to 1996 and 96 after. It's a huge difference. And so we're not seeing fish at age one or two reach the sizes that they used to. Um, it's a very dramatic difference. And so if you cheated and read the top of the slide, you'd know that uh, we think it's invasive species, right? Um, zebra mussels, quagga mussels, all the dreissenid mussels. I'm assuming somebody else is giving a talk on um, you know, invasive species stuff today, but I'm gonna cover a little bit of what we're seeing um, this is just one part of why we think uh, whitefish are declining, but I'll go through what, in what ways we're having issues, and it may not be the ways you might think. So one thing to point out, a little, little bit of green water is not bad. Um, the stuff in the middle there, uh, those are like phytoplankton, right? So a little bit of nutrients, those guys do great. The little zooplankton will eat that. And then your fish could eat that. So any baby fish you can think of. So white fish are not the only fish. Every little fish eats these guys. Um, but a little bit of green is good. Obviously, too much is bad. And so Lake Erie down in Ohio would be a, a terrific example of this. They get green algae so thick and toxic that it kills everything. Um, and there are even, even hypoxic zones where the algae is either died or is dying off and the bottom of the lake has gone hypoxic and all the fish cannot live there. So they have to live above that line, which is like two or three feet down from the surface. But I will say inversely, if your water is so clear that you can see 50, 60 feet to the bottom, that is really, really bad as well. Um, from a point of, of life, if you're thinking about what can live there, if you're seeing 60 feet down, that's a barren wasteland and that nothing can survive there. Um, and unfortunately it's not all just about food. Um, UV light is really detrimental. I'm sure everybody's been to the beach and gotten sunburned, but UV light is also really like a lot of fish have a slime coat that holds like a, like a blue color and that'll help them deal with UV light. But when you're really, really small, you can't. So nowadays, in Lake Michigan, we're seeing light penetrations as deep as like 40 feet down, maybe even farther. UV light didn't used to hit that far. We used to only get UV light maybe five to 10 feet, maybe three to four feet. Uh, but now that we're getting it deeper and deeper and deeper, uh, we're realizing that this is really, really bad uh, for like fish like whitefish and Cisco's. So we're a part of a research project with Miami University and USGS, uh, Nikki Berry, uh, I think she's, she was a student. I think she now has her PhD. But anyways, we tested the UV light, UVA, UVB, all that kind of stuff. But by testing it, we saw that the eggs and the larvae <clears throat> were really, really like sensitive to UV light. So they were getting barbecued. Like, you know, imagine just being outside in the sun on the beach for a full day, getting the worst sunburn than just sitting out there for the next week or something like that. Like it, they're just being barbecued down there. Now those are any of the eggs that may have been laid and did not fall under a rock or got covered up in any way. Um, of those that didn't get, uh, you know, that were covered up, if they maybe then got exposed later, if they're eyed up, they will emergency eject out of their shell early. And just like a premature baby, they're not fully formed. And they have really, really high mortality rates. So UV light penetrating down, even if it doesn't kill the egg immediately, maybe there's ice cover in the way, but maybe the ice is gone early. 
well, they may be getting zapped and coming out way too early. Like we'll get them 60 days or more prior to the, a normal hatch. Um, additionally, they're very photopositive when they hatch, they go to the surface. And so they're getting barbecued at the surface as well. It's just a natural uh, uh, kind of a reaction. I think that they go up there to find food. And a lot of times if like some core are going to spawn very deep, so they're going all the way to the surface, maybe 700 feet up. Um, so yeah, UV light has had a huge impact. I mean, even if it doesn't kill them, a lot of times it compromises their immune system. So a little, a little, you know, dry scented muscle invasion has huge impacts. Yellow perch also really suffer from this, I believe, as well. Um, moving on to our next part of some of the studies that we're working on. Um, obviously, the zebra mussels and the quagga mussels are all filtering the water out, right? So having really, really low nutrient levels and really, really low zooplankton levels, algae levels. Um, there's no food for the fish. And so these plots really aren't terribly important if you remember them or can read them. The point of the one in the middle is just that you know that or can see the older ones, the older samples we have from the 80s when they were testing zooplankton densities and those that we tested in the early 2000s were dramatically different. And they're absolutely more zooplankton per, per liter or cubic meter of water is directly proportional to how many fish we find. So you could almost put a straight line and connect pretty close all four of those dots. Um, and so we're working with Lake Superior State University, uh, Bay Mills Indian Community, the Great Lakes Fisheries Trust on a project where we're looking at the amount of zooplankton in the lake and like how much does it take to get one fish to survive? Like how dense does it have to be? You know, is it one fish or one zooplankton per Cubic meter, does it have to be one zooplankton per, per liter? And additionally, we're working with Central Michigan University on a similar project, looking at zooplankton densities. All in all, we're hoping that we can go out into the lake, we can just measure zooplankton densities and have an idea of how many larvae could potentially survive here. Um, so just a little bit of an invasion of an invasive species, and now we're having huge issues with an entire ecosystem once now used to have a lot of uh, used to be very productive. Now we don't really have any zooplankton or any food web for anything to build upon. So at least for the tribe, this is this is one of the things that we're trying to figure out is the recruitment issue. Uh, in the meantime, we're working with Sioux Tribe to use walleye ponds. So walleye they grow them in outdoor ponds because indoors they have issues with their eyes are too sensitive to light. They eat each other like crazy. So they grow them in ponds and Sioux Tribe is one of the best around to do pond culture. And so they converted one of their walleye ponds into a whitefish pond. And so we're actually able to fertilize this pond to be like a normal productive system. And su surprisingly, they love it. Even though it's kind of warm water, they do really, really, really well. Uh, so Sioux Tribe has had tremendous success with this. And a couple of years ago, we kind of jumped in as well. We worked with the Beta Knock Great Lakes sports fishermen, and we joined them and we uh, put some fish in one of their ponds. It's right along Lake uh, Michigan in north northern Green Bay. Uh, those fish did get transported back to Little Travers. It was just a test pond. Uh, but again, we did, we had fantastic results. The only issue we ran into was uh, birds eating them. But you could really tell the nutrient level differences in this pond compared to the other one. We didn't really fertilize this pond at all. And basically all the fish and everything got, all the nutrients got used up pretty quickly. Uh, so these are all, op these are some of the options we're, we're reviewing to buy us more time as far as the restoration goes. But I didn't say it already, and it might not have been apparent in those other pictures or other plots. Our, since we're not seeing any babies recruit, it just means our population is getting older and older and older. And so natural like loss, like just, dying of old age is happening. And we're getting fish into the 25 and 30 year old range where we used to not see that barely ever. But now our entire population is over the age of 25. It's very big, but we're having no babies. We haven't seen babies since 2003. Um, and so we don't think they live terribly longer than that. So that's why we're pushing these um, 
uh, timelines is we're like, gotta get moving, gotta get moving. Now, the only place that we do see recruitment is uh, Southern Green Bay. Uh, Southern Green Bay is actually doing quite, quite awesome. And what they've found in the last few years is that their river spawning populations of whitefish have come back and they're now putting out more fish than the than the lake is. Uh, they're more successful. And a lot of that has to do with those are the only nutrient rich areas are those coming out of the rivers. Um, and so I have a, a little map here from Lydia Lydia's uh, paper, but the Menominee, the Peshtigo, the Oncanto, and the Fox Rivers all have tremendous output. And Green Bay right now is the only place in the Great Lakes where we're seeing populations of whitefish grow. And if you live in around the northern side of Lake Michigan and you're seeing a little bit of whitefish, we think a lot of those are actually straying outside of Green Bay. Like they're just so big, they're actually starting to reach out because whitefish will travel a really, really long ways. Um, so for the tribe, we actually joined a work group or helped start a work group with the Nature Conservancy, Sioux Tribe, Bay Mills, and the DNR. Um, we came together trying to like kickstart or investigate how we can kickstart river spawning populations uh, here in Michigan, or at least the east side of Lake Michigan. So any tributary along there, Sioux Tribe is actually looking at the northern part of Lake Huron. Uh, so yeah, we're looking into this. Um, we've taken a few steps. Sioux Tribe has already started stocking of the Pine River, which is west of Cedarville, and the Carp River, which is north of St. Ignace. So they have a couple years in on that. We started uh, the Jordan River last year. And so we're hopeful to keep that going over the next few years. It's a long-term approach, but the river mouth is much more productive than the greater lake right now. And in fact, we are semi-fortunate that we have drowned river mouths like Lake Charlevoix, uh, you know, Muskegon Lake and all that. Drowned river mouths are a lot more productive because they're getting that huge influx and they're not yet watered down by the greater lake. Um, so these really productive environments were hopeful, just like in Green Bay, we'll see that kind of kickstart. And so as far as the tribes are concerned or our work group's concerned, we're trying to kickstart spawning runs. We want to see natural recruitment out of those. And then we want to see multiple year classes come out of it. And so that way, even though we're having invasive species that take a really big hit on our white fish or in a lot of fish, uh, we might be able to get around it a little bit. And uh, this strategy would also work for a lot of other species. So we're kind of pioneering it a little bit, trying to get in there. But once we get it figured out, we should be able to move to, you know, maybe it's round whitefish or lake trout used to run rivers. Uh, Cisco's used to run rivers. But this is our long-term uh, approach to trying to deal with something that one invasive species really messed up. Any questions? Let's see if I can... Thanks, Chris. Uh, there's one question so far. We have time for a couple if um, a few more people want to chime in. Um, the first question is, what do you mean by fertilizing the pond or fertilizing? Yes. I think you mentioned fertilizing rivers too, but are you just adding certain nutrients or is that something else entirely? Yes. So we add uh, phosphorus and ammonia. Um, I add granulated phosphorus and granulated urea. Uh, that ammonia or the, the urea, I think it's supposed to be 20 to one. So for every gram of phosphorus, you need 20 grams of, of um, uh, urea. When we talk about like the difference between healthy and like Lake Erie, you know, it only takes like 40 pounds of phosphorus for a 20 or 60 acre lake. It only takes a few pounds and you will just turn it into that picture from Lake Erie. So like that's that's one thing, but also where we're at, if you're in the big lake, like you might ask, why didn't we just think about fertilizing the big lake? Even if you were to fertilize, you would just basically run all those nutrients right back into the zebra with all the mussels. So it's it's not really that productive. But in a controlled setting like walleye ponds and stuff like that, yeah, we just fertilize them to get them just enough phytoplankton for the zooplankton to go. And if you have the whole little ecosystem running, you'll have enough fish in there to eat all the zooplankton to keep the water green and 
kind of keep things rolling. So it's kind of a balancing act and it takes a little while to kind of figure out. Okay, cool. Um, a couple more have come in. So what, uh, how often, and then what activities, I think as far as the stocking is concerned are happening in the Jordan River? Uh, so the Jordan River, we are stocking eggs. And so it's kind of a different approach. We're trying to get them to imprint on the Jordan River. Uh, so at this point, we're not putting any larvae in. If we can figure out how to imprint the larvae to that river source and then stock them, we'll probably aim to do that because we could leverage a little more of our resources and get a little more bang for a buck. Uh, but at this point, this year and maybe next year, there'll probably be eggs going in. Uh, did I answer that? Okay. Part of that? Yes, I think so. Um, it, there was also how often. So during what seasons does that oh, happen? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. So uh, we should be collecting eggs at the end of November. We will incubate them on at our hatchery until they eye up. And then we'll go out in February. We'll put them in the Jordan River. And then they should hatch by early March, depending on the river temp. And so then those fish will move out. And that should hopefully keep going probably for at least the next seven years. We won't see any returns for at least five to seven years, depending on how fast the fish grow in the lake. So the temperature um, determines how fast they grow. Is that what yep. you're saying? Yep, and what's, yeah, everything, yep. Well, yeah, so what's the ideal river temperature then? We want them to get really, really cold in the wintertime, then warm up pretty good in the summertime. So um, a lot of times like ice coverage in the lake, the lake will get nice and cold and maybe four degrees or below. Um, rivers will do the same thing. They'll even go down to almost zero centigrade. Um, and then you want them to have a long period of time cold because that helps them develop in the eggshell. Uh, the longer it's cold, the more they stay in there and the larger they'll hatch out at. And so the longer they're in there, the bigger they are, the more independent they are when they hatch. And then early spring, yep, you'll see it warm up. And then we've seen like some of our walleye ponds, they've gotten all the way up to like 28 degrees centigrade. So I'm guessing that's around 80. And our whitefish have done quite well. Hmm. Uh, I would probably say our the whitefish, their favorite temperature is about 70 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, about 18 to 20 degrees centigrade. Uh, they do really, really well. So hopefully that answers the water temperature question that just popped up. Um, and then there's another question about um, any impact of harvest rules if if we have a the survival of the young that's the problem. So are we seeing that the, the whitefish, are the whitefish that we see in restaurants farmed um, because they seem pretty highly available to us, right? Like on our plate. They are. So I think if I can get my presentation to roll backwards all the way to the front. Well, right. I'm close. Uh, so I guess this, this slide would probably be the best one to point at. We're still harvesting quite a bit of fish out of there. We're just not seeing any babies. So mm -hmm. it'd be the equivalent of like, you know, everybody being over the age of 80, you know, nobody's had a kid in a two decades. Well, I guess we're going to be kind of concerned about that. Or maybe I guess in this case it'd be nobody's had any kids in 60 years and people are like, oh my God, what's going on? So for the fish, we should have seen babies a long time ago, or at least a couple of little blips on the radar. Uh, and we're not. So they are out there and we may have one of the largest populations of whitefish we've ever seen, but they're getting to the end of their life. Uh, and so commercial fishing has been going on. I know a lot of people are really worried about overfishing, which absolutely is a thing. Um, a long time ago. So in 1927, I think it was, the state of Michigan had over 10,000 commercial fishermen. And every one of those fishermen put out more net than all of our fishermen today combined. Mm -hmm. to give some kind of perspective on that. I think we might have like less than a dozen, maybe less than two dozen fishermen left, certainly less than two dozen in Lake Michigan. Um, so like the scale of that is just insane. So we went from 10,000 to maybe 10, right? A thousand fold decrease. Um, so the amount of effort going to the lake is, is greatly reduced. And so that's really helped a lot over time, but now we're harvesting enough fish 
that we really have no influence on the outcome of what happens. So whether we don't fish or do fish, all the fish are going to die of old age in the next three, four years, it, you know, maybe five. Um, we don't, yeah, we don't really have any, you know, if there's a million fish in the lake and we're harvesting a thousand of them, it's a very, very small number. Okay. So I was thinking about a question of my own too. So if the Green Bay, um, Green Bay rivers and or Green Bay tributaries are being very productive, are we going to see any of those Green Bay fish migrate into, into the main body of Lake Michigan? We are seeing I have a picture of Michigan. Maybe I did. Um, we are seeing some fish migrate out and they're going into, uh, uh, I guess this is kind of it. Do I have a highlighter? It says I can highlight things. <laughs> can you see that? Yeah, yep. Um, so they are going up and out and into the main main lake. Like I think they still see quite a bit. But the farther you get away from Green Bay, the fewer fish we find. Okay. So like Navin Way has more fish and younger fish than we do in, say, Cross Village. Right. Okay. Cross Village has younger and more fish than we see in like Little Traverse Bay. And honestly, Grand Traverse Bay, for whatever reason, those fish are pretty tight to staying down there. So for the most part, a lot of those fish are just staying down in there. And so their population is mildly protected. Uh, they, they're they just kind of stable. They're at a really low level. They're not doing great, but uh, they're not recruiting, but they're not going away as fast. Okay. Any other last questions for Chris? I didn't see any popping up. Anything else you want to make sure we know or can do before? <laughs> I hope. I I think there was somebody talking about mussels maybe today. Is yes. Yep. So maybe they have all the answers. I hope I didn't steal anything from what they're doing. But we'll see. She's next up. So. Oh man. Well, I apologize. <laughs> perfect. But perfect. It's perfect important segment. stuff. So everybody keep your <laughs> keep listening. All right. Thanks, Chris. Um, so yeah. So next up, we do have uh, Danielle Matuzek. Hopefully, I said that correctly. Danielle, great. Um, so she is a biologist with the Southeastern Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission, and she is going to talk to us about freshwater, um, both native and invasive mussels. So All right. Danielle. Are you guys seeing my big presentation? Yes, looks great. Okay, fantastic. Um, if it looks like I'm staring into space, I have multiple monitors set up, so I promise I'm not. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I am Danielle Matuzak. I'm a specialist biologist at the Southeastern Wisconsin Regional Planning Commission. So I currently am not working and living in Michigan. However, um, fun fact, uh, Marcella Domka and I went to grad school together. Um, so I did live in Michigan for a while, so I am up on kind of the muscle kind of populations in Michigan. Um, and so, as was mentioned, I'll be talking about freshwater mussels and kind of their conservation. Uh, the presentation will be heavily focused on kind of what you as riparian owners and lake users can kind of do and keep in mind to kind of help protect, protect um, these organisms that are living in our lakes and rivers. So just a quick uh, little background information. Um, so I work for the Regional Planning Commission, the Southeastern one in Wisconsin. So in Wisconsin, there are multiple planning commissions and we are quasi-governmental. Um, so we are in between state level government like the DNR and above county government. Um, the commission was established in 1960. So we actually predate the Clean Water Act and a lot of our water resources data and kind of historical reports and plans um, also predate that Clean Water Act. Um, we are composed of teams of scientists, planners, engineers, GIS specialists, um, and the team I specifically am on is the Lakes and Rivers team, and we do everything from aquatic plant management plans to recreational use studies to uh, we currently have a regional chloride study that we're doing across the seven counties that we have jurisdiction over. And so as part of my job, I do a lot of water resources planning. Um, however, my graduate uh, degree is in fisheries and wildlife, um, ecology and evolution behavior from Michigan State University, where I did look at 
invasive muscles as my primary research topic. So without further ado, I will jump into uh, the meat of the presentation. And we are gonna talk a little bit about muscle history and some facts about muscles and native muscles before I jump into kind of the threats to them. So starting out in Michigan and in much of the Midwest, uh, mussels were actually farmed in a way um, where people would go out into the wild, pick them up, keep them and make buttons out of them. So a lot of buttons you find in very, very old clothing where they're kind of that pearly iridescent look, they were actually made out of mussel shells. They would punch holes as seen on the photo here, make buttons out of them to the point where the populations of mussels declined greatly in the early 1900s. Um, the Michigan DNR, previously called something else, it wasn't quite the DNR then, um, put some restrictions in on the harvesting of mussels. And by the end of the 1940s, in conjunction with the kind of regulations that were put around harvesting mussels um, and the increased use of plastic to make buttons, the demand lessened for native mussels to be used to make these buttons. However, Michigan native mussel populations are still not considered stable, um, and many scientists contribute this to the wide over-harvesting of them in the early 1900s. Additionally, native mussels have great cultural significance, uh, not only in Michigan, but uh, across North America. Um, indigenous populations once utilized them as a very important source of food. They would use the shells to make tools all sorts of things. Um, unfortunately, though, due to contaminants um, mainly caused by humans, such as PCBs, which is a polycarbonated biphenyl, um, heavy metals, uh, native mussels are typically not edible anymore. Um, so if you see native mussels, please leave them alone. Don't eat them. Um, it's not good for them, and it's not good for you. Um, and so jumping into some fast facts to kind of help set this stage, um, so North America has the highest diversity of freshwater mussels, about 300 species, um, give or take. Um, that being said, many of these species are endangered, threatened, um, and are at risk of going extinct or they're at risk of their habitat um, being so decimated by um, humans and a whole bunch of other things that I'll get into that they're at risk of going extinct. And so when you have healthy mussel populations in lakes and rivers, that's typically an indication of a healthy water body. Um, they're very sensitive to any sort of pollutants in the water. They're sensitive to temperature, to what kind of substrate they're using as their habitat. So typically they prefer sand, gravel, small cobble. They really are not the biggest fans of soft, flocculent, mucky matter on the bottom of lakes and rivers. They like a little bit more stable substrate to kind of burrow into and then filter feed from. And so similar to invasive mussels, um, native mussels are filter feeders. Um, and so as was mentioned in the previous uh, presentation, how zebra mussels can drastically filter feed uh, out all of the plankton and all of the good stuff in the water, it leaves nothing for the native mussels. Um, however, in the flip side of that, native mussels also can help filter feed and clean the wa water in a sense. They act as a filter on a fish tank would, um, you know, if you have a goldfish tank in your room. Um, in addition, they provide food for other organisms. And this is everything from otters to raccoons, um, herons, egrets, muskrat, all sorts of things. Something that is very interesting about native mussels is their reproductive cycle. And I'm going to focus a little more time on this since a lot of the threats to native mussels come at specific stages in their reproductive cycle. So to kind of do a brief overview, you'll have a male and a female mussel um, at the bottom of a lake, say. Those males will release sperm into the water column where the larvae will be kind of filtered out by the female, and she will internally fertilize them within herself. Um, they will get to a certain uh, size and certain kind of time span, and this varies greatly for the time and size um, with each mussel species, but they'll develop inside the female, and then eventually they will be released into the water by the female. When they are released in the water, they are called glucidium, and this small larval stage is when they have to find their host fish. So many, most native uh, species of uh, mussels use a host fish. So some use multiple species of fish. 
Some use just one. There are some native species that use salamanders, I believe, um, or mud puppies, but the vast majority of native mussels use fish as a host fish, um, as a parasitic stage in their life cycle. So the larval mussels, the glucidium, will attach to the gills of the host fish and kind of ride around in the gills of that fish until they have reached their juvenile stage. Once they've reached that juvenile stage, they'll detach from the host fish's gills and fall to the floor of the water body. Now, this is where when they're falling to the floor of the water body, they need to try and find, you know, a good substrate to kind of make their home in. Um, most native mussel species don't travel great distances. They're for the most part sessile creatures. Um, some of them can move a little bit, but you won't be seeing them travel great distances uh, like whitefish would um, as an example. And so they'll stay for the most part kind of in the area that they landed in when they were juveniles. And so once they those juveniles fall from their host fish and go down to the bottom of the lake or river, they'll mature there at the bottom of the water body until they've reached reproductive age and then the cycle starts back over again. Um, and so throughout all of this, are, there are many different things that can impact uh, their reproduction. So water temperature, um, currents, flow, the amount of food available, the amount of fish available, um, temperatures impacts on fish, the substrate availability, a whole host of things. Um, and so some of these I will be getting into today and kind of describing specifically how they are um, threatening native mussel populations, and then also talk a little bit about what you as riparian owners and lake users can do to kind of mitigate some of these things. So some of the threats, as I've mentioned a little bit already, um, we have the decline of their host fish species. Um, so they're the fish that they need to have their kind of parasitic stage in for the reproduction. There's also the effects of climate change, as many people have heard, where event, the water um, that we have in our lakes and rivers are, is warming over time. So when you have species of fish and mussels that are sensitive to temperatures, this can impact them. Um, and then we also have polluted runoff from increased urbanization in the landscape. Um, now in Northern Michigan, which is I believe where you guys are mainly located as Marcella kind of showed on her maps, um, there's not quite as high of a density of population as you would say in like the Detroit area. Um, however, you still have some development around these lakes and rivers that can cause runoff into the lands from the landscape into the lakes. And then as was touched on a little bit in the prior, prior presentation, you do have the introduction of invasive mussel species and invasive fish as well. And so I'll touch on the decline of host fish. So as mentioned, they have that pair, native mussels have that parasitic phase um, where they are attached to the gills of a host fish. Um, they kind of ride around as a buddy of the host fish until they've reached their juvenile stage where they then fall off. And so because freshwater mussels depend on the, this uh, sometimes only a single species um, for their uh, life stage, if that single species of fish is at risk from overfishing, warming waters, lack of habitat, lack of um, you know, juvenile recruitment, um, then you have risk to the muscle population in turn, since that key stage of their life cycle is unable to be fulfilled since there are not host fish available for them. And then I also mentioned climate change. So most lakes and rivers we've seen um, across the Midwest and across North America are very slowly warming due to increase in greenhouse gas emissions, the increase of kind of the extent of climate change, um, and so this kind of reduces the range to where host fish and mussels can survive based on the uh, kind of water temperatures. In addition to water temperatures, we're having less ice. This is also touched on in the previous presentation, which was an excellent setup for mine. Um, so we're seeing kind of this increase in temperature, decrease in ice, um, all of which affect both the temperatures of the water, but also where the host fish can live, as well as where the mussels are able to survive now. And so with climate change, we see increased intense precipitation. Um, these events are more irregular. They're more, um, you know, consist, they're irregular, larger, more intense, um, as we've seen with, you know, the hurricanes down in Florida this year. Um, and so these high intensity precipitation events can cause a large increase in runoff of polluted stormwater into our lakes and rivers, which again, in turn can pollute the waters and become, uh, make the waters 
either have pollutants in them that they will bioaccumulate in the muscles themselves as they filter feed, or can cause harm to the actual muscles or the host fish themselves. And so with this, as you have increased runoff into the water body, you have increased sedimentation, where sediments that have been run into the lake are slowly settling out of the water column and are in turn settling on top of these muscles that, again, don't move around that much and will effectively suffocate them. And I touched on pollution. So when we have urban sprawl, when we have more development happening around water bodies, lakes, rivers, and when I say development, this is anything from rural homes, urban, suburban, uh, wastewater treatment plants, croplands, all of the things that are kind of um, listed on this diagram here. Since mussels are filter feeders, they're incredibly susceptible to polluted runoff and any sort of contaminants or nutrient loading that is in the water column. Again, as you are seeing, there's kind of a theme through this. If we're hurting our host fish, if we're hurting the habitat, our mussel population themselves are not gonna be able to thrive. And so when we're looking at pollution from a variety of areas, whether it's from a big city, from a wastewater treatment plant, or just from cropland, or even in some cases, forested areas, um, there's going to be runoff to some extent. That's natural, that's part of the hydraulic cycle. However, it's what's in the water as it's running off into our water bodies is what we need to be very aware of, making sure there's not fertilizers, um, you know, direct sources of pollution, all of these things. And so as was touched on, invasive mussels. So this was a very hot topic um, in Wisconsin for a very long time, in Michigan as well. Um, now zebra mussels are fairly commonly known about, fairly um, researched in the last, you know, several decades. Um, it is thought that zebra mussels and quagga mussels were originally introduced into the Great Lakes in 1980s, give or take. Um, and so zebra mussels and quagga mussels are very aggressive species of non-native mussels. They are aggressive colonizers. They're aggressive filter feeders. Um, as was mentioned in the Great Lakes, zebra mussels have and quagga mussels have effectively decimated the phytoplankton and plankton communities in the Great Lakes. Um, and they're also, as aggressive colonizers, as pictured here, they can colonize on top of native species and basically starve them to that because the native species are not able to open all the way, which prevents them from getting out, um, being able to pull in water to filter feed. And so this besides being as strong competition for feeding, colonizing on top of natives, zebra mussels and quagga mussels in general are a bit of bad news. Um, some big news here in Wisconsin um, where I am located, one of our large lakes, Geneva Lake, um, recently had a confirmed discovery of quagga mussels. Up until now, Wisconsin's only ever had zebra mussels. Um, we now have a confirmed um, genetically DNA tested um, population of quagga mussels that have established and been established, we expect, for a few years in inland lakes. So the spread of invasive species um, is something that is very to the forefront of all of our minds in many ways as we're trying to prevent the introduction to new lakes and prevent them from spreading from lakes where they already exist and manage the populations where they've already established. And besides zebra and quagga mussels, Asian clams, which are found in some lakes and rivers, are also competitive with native mussels um, for similar reasons, uh, strong competition for feeding, taking habitat, those things. But for the interesting part, what can you guys do? So when it comes to what riparian owners, lake users, lake managers can do to help all of these different issues that I've listed, there's some things that are very easily done and there's others that take a little bit more time and planning. And so I'll go over the few topics that I've gone over already and kind of give a little bit of a list of what you guys can do to help kind of protect and restore muscle populations in your water bodies. So as I mentioned, the decline of host fish. So we wanna be protecting the habitat of these host fish. So that includes aquatic plants, that includes everything from, you know, the pond weeds to lily pads, all of that sort of thing. We also wanna prevent the introduction of invasive fish. So not just invasive mussels, but invasive fish. Um, similar to how invasive mussels are direct competition to native mussels, well, invasive fish are direct competition to native fish. So we wanna be preventing the introduction of invasive species in general. 
We also encourage the participation in tree drops to add woody habitat to your lake. So pictured on the side here is a um, picture of what we call coarse woody habitat. It's based on um, the, the Wisconsin DNR's definition of it. Um, and so it's basically trees that have fallen into the water and provide habitat for not only you know turtles, amphibians as a gateway into the water, but also for small juvenile fish or fish that stay small to hide in. Um, so if a tree falls on your riparian property line into the water, we encourage you to leave it. Or if you can't leave it exactly where it fell, move it over to somewhere where it can stay. Um, it provides great habitat for young fishes um, or just small fish to hide and then kind of boost that recruitment to then make sure that population of host fish are readily available for our native mussel species. And then the big one, as I talked about, is climate change. So many people are like, well, what can I do? I'm just one person. There's a few things that you can do to help mitigate climate change and kind of help with this. Um, the first is make sure that your political representatives are aware on what your opinions are on climate change and any sort of policy you'd like to go with them. Additionally, you can look for green alternatives to your household and community um, and support those alternatives and initiatives. So that can be green energy, um, compost, preventing runoff, all of these things. Planting native trees and shrubs to help mitigate with the carbon in the air um, and shop responsibly. Um, vote with your dollar. Make sure you're supporting groups and organizations that um, maybe have a bit more of a green uh, mindset rather than just your classic capitalism. And then pollution is a big thing that riparian owners can help mitigate. Um, you are kind of the last line of defense before you're entering the water to stormwater runoff. So this is an excellent um, diagram. It is not my own. It is from the Michigan Natural Shoreline Partnership. They have some fantastic resources on um, kind of shoreline habitat establishment, um, reducing pollution runoff, all of these things. And so I won't go over every single thing that is in this slide, but in general, you want to make sure that you're keep your shoreline stable to prevent erosion and if, if prevent all of those all the sediment going into the lakes. Pick up your animal waste, um, prevent dirty stormwater from getting into the lake by planting rain gardens, as Marcella talked about. Um, all of these things can help prevent polluted runoff from reaching the lakes and in turn um, can help prevent the actual pollution of the lakes, which then inhibits that reproduction and life stages of mussels. And finally, invasive mussels. So I'm sure many of you have seen this diagram or this image um, at different boat launches. Um, so it's clean, drain, dry, stop aquatic hitchhikers, um, basically clean all of your recreational equipment or in the cases of being scientists or lake managers, your research equipment before you go to a different lake. Um, even if you think, oh, there's no invasive species in this lake, no worry. You may not know, they may just not be visible, they could be hiding. Um, so make sure you're cleaning all of your uh, equipment before you are moving. You can also post signage to lake users um, and residents on invasive species. That way they are know what they look like, they know how to prevent them. Um, you can also monitor your water body regularly for invasive species. There are a variety of volunteer programs, um, including with um, MyCore that you can enroll in to help monitor your lakes and rivers for invasive species. And one thing that's a little bit more expensive, but that um, is really quite good for your lakes is installing boat launch um, or boat equipment cleaning stations at launches. So um, here in Wisconsin, we have many different companies that make them. Um, CD3 is one, so Clean Drain Dry 3, um, where they basically have pressure washers, scrubbies, sponges, ble bleach solutions, all the things you need to effectively clean your equipment. Um, and thus make sure you aren't spreading invasive species from water body to water body. Um, and then finally, learning to identify invasive mussels. If you aren't actively monitoring your lake for invasive species, even knowing what invasive mussels look like is a great thing. That way, if you're out boating with friends or you're you know, walking along your shoreline and you see something, you're like, that doesn't look native. You're able to take a picture, take a sample of it and reach out to someone who will be able to confirm whether or not that is an invasive and kind of do some very early on stages of monitoring to help prevent further spread if it does end up being an invasive species. So finally, these are some in general things that you guys can do to help that don't fit in any of the categories that I have mentioned already. 
Um, so first off is educate yourself on the native mussel species in your population, in, in the populations within your own water body. Um, again, those that live on or near these water bodies, you know, kind of that line of defense against um, introductions to native species or, you know, protecting the native species. And so if you're able to learn a little bit about some of the native species, that'll also help you identify what's not native or what's not normal. Or if, you know, for years you've been seeing, you know, tons of heel splitter native mussels, and then all of a sudden you see none. Well, you might want to reach out to one of your natural resources managers and mention that. Um, since unfortunately, many times uh, natural resource managers cannot be out on every single lake every day, monitoring it, watching for patterns, as people who live on or near the lakes can. Additionally, since again, as I've mentioned, mussels are for most part sessile creatures, they don't move around that much. Um, if you have really intense motorized boating activity happening right on top of mussel beds, um, you're basically stirring up the sediment, which will then will resettle down on top of them. You can have them get scraped up with props. Um, so just making sure that if you have a really rich mussel bed that you're protecting it um, from this intense motorized traffic. And then finally, also talking about how if you have any sort of building projects. So I'm sure Wisconsin and Michigan regulations on building of piers, culverts is different. Um, but if you do see that people are putting in permanent docks or if there's culverts being put in or any sort of kind of uh, building of boardwalks, bridges, that sort of stuff, reach out to someone who is involved in that and say, hey, have you guys taken into consideration if there's any mussel populations in the vicinity that would have to be accounted for before you start construction or before you have to um, do any remediation efforts if it does end up impacting that native species. Um, so these are all things that you can do to help. Um, and in some, in some cases, it seems a little overwhelming. Well, I'm just one person, what can I do? Well, if I like to use the drop in a bucket theory, um, you may think that you're just one single drop. Okay, I'm just one drop of water. I'll never fill up the bucket. Well, if you and a couple of other friends, okay, now you're three drops. And if each of those people has several more drops, eventually you're gonna have enough drops to fill the bucket and actually make a change. Um, so that's kind of the mentality to have of even you as an individual person can have really great impacts on your lake's health. So with that, I'll take any questions. Um, it was wonderful to present to everyone and the, so far what I've watched of the other presentations has been very interesting. So I'll take any questions now. Thanks, Danielle. That's really cool to learn a little bit more about mussels, sort of a, I know lots of people have been noticing fewer and fewer mussels um, in lakes. Um, so we do have some questions. Steve wants to know in that life cycle, are there any issues or maybe detrimental effects for the host fish? Um, so I, it, it varies from fish to fish. Primarily, it is a parasitic um, kind of relationship. Um, for the most fish, the fish won't typically die from it. Um, it's not like you're having, it's not like you have a full, um, an adult muscle hanging off their gills. They're incredibly, incredibly tiny. Um, most of the time, the fish barely notice. Um, I'm not an expert on every single of the 300 species that there are in North America, but the overwhelming majority, for the most part, it's not widely detrimental to those host fish. Um, otherwise, um, you know, there's there's no benefit to killing your host fish if you may need them again next year. True enough. Um, <laughs> and then are there certain species of fish that are favorites, maybe that we might see in sort of these northern um, inland lakes? Potentially, yes. Um, so Again, Northern Michigan is a little bit outside of my uh, jurisdictional yeah. area of where I know fish. Um, I'm also not a fisheries biologist for the most part. Um, I focus more on the invertebrates, aquatic plants. However, um, many species of trout are host fish. Um, and a lot of the host fish aren't necessarily game fish either. So trout is kind of an obvious, a more, you know, it's a very typical uh, game fish. Um, but many host species have, you know, there's species of fish that most people don't know exist, like uh, daces or darters um, that are very small. You know, mm -hmm. most people just lump them in with the minnows. Um, so it's not always, oh, there's, you know, all of these big game fish that are these really important, like what we think is important as game fish necessarily is not necessarily what the mussels think is important. So um, if you are curious about what specific game fish are in your lake, um, check 
look at your muscles, try and ID them. iNaturalist is a great way to kind of, for people to get on, on the go, ID their muscles. Um, and then you can look up what sort of species are there in your lake um, to coincide with those native species yeah. of mussels. That's great. Um, and then we have a couple of questions about um, snails. First, are snails mussels? And then I think the there's another question sort of maybe asking like, are we seeing any effects um, on sort of with these effects and habitat from invasive mussels? Um, are we seeing any other sort of invasive snails coming on or other sort of detrimental effects that have anything to do with snails as well? Certainly. Um, so I'll, I'll start at the first of those questions yeah. <laughs> and kind of work my way through. Um, so snails are not mussels. Mussels are bivalves. So they have, you kind of saw me using my little kind of clam hand. Um, so mussels are bivalves. They have a hinge and they open like this. Um, snails typically um, are have more of your typical kind of snail shell where it's, it's a corkscrew or a, yeah, a ram's horn, something like that, where they the organism is inside, but doesn't necessarily fully go inside and can't fully close off. Some species of snails do have an operculum, which is a little little trap door that they can close themselves into their shells. So uh, Chinese mystery snails, which can get to be the size of a golf ball and are non-native, um, have an operculum, which they can close themselves up into their shell. Um, but no, snails are a different um, kind of family of organisms than bivalves. But Many of the things that are, you know, threats to native mussel species are also threats to snails. Um, snails typically do not filter feed, though. Um, they more kind of munch along the little cows of our lakes. They'll munch along algae on hard surfaces. So they also, for the most part, are not huge fans of mucky substrate. That being said, um, if you have a really great population of pond weeds and lily pads um, in flocculent matter. Um, your snails will live on the plants rather than on the actual substrate themselves. So I think I touched on some of those. Yeah. Are there any questions I missed in? <laughs> I don't think so. The, 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 some of the snail questions weren't super detailed. So if you want some more information, um, ask, ask again. Um, and then a question Brian's asking about um, any successful methods of controlling or reducing invasive mussels once they're established um, in lakes. And I know USGS has some sort of small lake projects happening across the region. But Yeah, so USGS has some pilot projects going right now um, to kind of see what different methods of um, removal, remediation, population control, that sort of thing um, are effective in lakes and rivers. Um, with that, a lot of it is still in the early research stage and is not yet um, permitted uh, to be used by you know, riparian owners or even lake managers. Um, similar to how we have you know, lamprosides or um, other sort of pesticides for other organisms, there are versions of pesticides that have been developed for zebra mussels specifically. Um, however, the efficacy of them is, you know, it's not tried and true. It's not, oh, okay, I'm going to dump this in my lake and all the mussels are gone. It, it varies lake to lake based on the composition of your lake, any other populations. Um, and I am never one to advocate for putting chemicals into your lake, such as herbicides, pesticides. Um, but there are some preliminary studies going um, for what can be done. Um, the hard part is, is with those invasive mussels, zebra mussels and quagga mussels, um, they have a, what's called a veliger stage. Um, so it's basically a free floating, almost microscopic stage um, where they just hang out in the water column. So if you aren't draining your boat, um, you may think, oh, I don't see, I don't see any mussels. There's none in there. Well, you could have thousands of basically juvenile mussels, villager stage mussels um, that you're transferring. So um, a lot of the studies are looking at more prevention of spread than actual in lake um, remediation. Um, that being said, um, one of the things I like to remind people to keep in mind is eventually mother nature will pull herself back into equilibrium. It just may not be in our lifetimes. Right. And we might not, we might have uh, 
a lot of detrimental change in the in the meantime, right? That we don't exactly really want to see. However, she'll <laughs> yeah figure she'll figure something out. We just don't know how mm -hmm. long it'll take, right? Um, there's a follow up question to some of those USGS um, studies. Perhaps do we know? Do you know how they would measure success in controlling those? Would that be um, clarity of water through like Secchi disk or inventories or something? Yeah, so I'm not, I haven't read the recent like press releases on them. Um, so the example given of like a secchi disk water clarity, um, zebra mussels, since they are so prolific at filter feeding, um, as Chris mentioned, you know, they can kind of clean out the Great Lakes of any sort of nutrients and inland lakes as well. Um, rather than an increase in secchi disk reading, you'd actually be looking for a decrease Right. In, in, in secchi reading, um, which would indicate less water clarity, less light penetration, um, meaning less filter feeding is happening. Um, it's not the, that metric isn't the best because you have native muscles that, okay, well, now there's less zebra muscles. Well, now finally, you know, the native muscles can start feasting um, instead of just getting the scraps the zebra muscles leave over. Um, so I'm not fully up on all of the studies, um, but the USGS normally is very good about updating and giving press releases and keeping their web pages updated with um, any of the research that they're doing. So if people have questions, I highly recommend them. They look it up on the USGS's website. Um, that's the best source of knowledge for that. And then someone asked for, <laughs> for a prediction from you about... Um, Sort of, uh, if you notice a new aquatic invasive mussel, um, sort of what might be next also? So is there more bad news on the horizon? So typically by the time that humans realize there's an invasive mussel in their lake, it's been there for a few years, um, which is why early detection and early monitoring is so important. Um, while we don't have tried and true practices to remove non-native muscles, um, that early detection certainly helps. Um, I guess I don't have a great answer for that <laughs> per se. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I don't, I'm trying to think, I, there's not really a great, I don't have a single answer for that per se. That's okay. The invasive species challenge is, uh, is pervasive. So we're keeping our eyes. Oh. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much, Danielle. We appreciate it. And again, if there are more questions, um, we'll, I, I think we're pretty much, we're staying on time so we can um, do some sort of final questions for everyone. If they're, if you're, if the presenters are able to stay online, then we will, um, we'll do some final questions for everyone at the end. Um, we're going to move on to, um, to Lindsay Haskin, who we're really happy to have on with us today. Uh, he is a writer, producer, and director um, with Skyhound Media. He's going to talk to us about sea lamprey um, and probably mention his newest film, um, Fish Thief, uh, which, um, and he'll talk about sort of sea lamprey, the effect that they've had on our Great Lakes culture, history, um, and um, we'll just take it away, Lindsay. We're happy to have you. Hello. I hope everybody can hear me. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Hello? You're sounding good. Oh, good. Okay. Well, thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, if you'd like, uh, well, let me just uh, give you a brief introduction here. I'm a filmmaker. I'm a Michigan native. I grew up in the suburbs of Detroit. Uh, I made a public television film about the Great Lakes uh, that started airing on public TV in 2012. And uh, that story was called Freshwater Seas. And uh, it included a short a uh, bit, probably about seven minutes about the sea lamprey story, the Great Lakes sea lamprey invasion story. And when that film was done, uh, the people at the Great Lakes Fishery Commission who helped me make that uh, film uh, offered me the opportunity to make the, the film that uh, we just screened in Harbor Springs with the tip of the Mitt Watershed Council uh, on October 2nd, I believe it was. And then uh, the, the story that, that I'm talking about today. So uh, I'm a Great Lakes native. I grew up fishing in the Great Lakes, so I knew that story. And, and also uh, uh, basically know how, how invasive species have changed the Great Lakes. I've experienced it personally myself. So anyway, what I'd like to do if I can, and if it will work, I would like to play uh, the trailer for the film, 
which uh, is it's about five minutes. So hopefully uh, you're going to be able to see this. I'm going to share my screen. And then uh, let's go there. Is that working? With allow Zoom to share your screen. Uh, let's see. Is that? Oh, I'm very bad at this and don't know uh, if I can make this happen or not. But it, Zoom, I'm not all that familiar with. So perhaps I'm not going to be able to do this. Anyway, um, let's see. What did the shit want? Stop video, uh, share screen, share sound, optimize for video clip, share, open system. Ah, okay, grant access. Okay, I'm figuring it out on the, uh, okay, here we go. Um, later, is it happening? Well, apparently this is not going to work. So. Um, I might be able to share from my screen, Lindsay. Let me let me try. Yeah, it out. If, if you have it, that'd be great. Thank you. Just, ah, this is what I want to share. Oh, I think I might have it. Here we go. Are you seeing it? Yes, the Great, great Lakes have a natural organizing force for the people of the region. The vastness of them is really hard to convey. The Great Lakes region holds one fifth of Earth's surface freshwater. They're very, very important to our economy. We've got the world's largest source of clean, fresh water. Kids grow up and they have that memory they associate it with their time and their summers with their family on the shores of Lake Michigan or Lake Huron. And fishing is an integral part of that. The fish that swim in the water are part of the lifeblood of the Great Lakes region. The importance of fishing is part of that full relationship with the natural world. Fishing is my life. I started fishing as a young kid. You see, young adults, you see women, and you see men, and they're all fishing. They just enjoy it. It's just a beautiful place. And a true outdoorsman, this is heaven. Fishing in the Great Lakes is such a valuable resource. For most of history, people simply assumed that the Great Lakes were so vast and packed with fish that there would always be plenty to catch. It was just too easy to throw a net in the water and pull money out. But by the 1950s, everything had changed. The fish most important to people were nearly gone. No one could explain it, let alone fix it. Whether you were in Lake Ontario or Lake Superior or everywhere in between, it was dire. From small towns up to major cities, it was people's livelihoods. We were at a loss as to what we were going to do Short on hope, some remarkable people tackled the mystery. Their odd discovery still menaces the Great Lakes today. It's been described as a moonshot. Probably the largest scale species recovery program ever. Their battle dramatically changed how people from all walks of life connect with these freshwater seas. We don't want to lose this. We've got to protect it. So uh, I guess I'm back. Can you all see me and hear me again? Yeah. Okay, great. So uh, I want to tell you based briefly about how this story came about. Um, Mark Gaydon, who is now the executive secretary of the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, uh, approached me about making this film as part of a larger oral history project that the Great Lakes Fishery Commission wanted to wanted to take on. So <clears throat> basically what what 
spurred this was the fact that most people in the Great Lakes region now take sea lamprey control for granted. People think that the sea lamprey control largely is a is a historical story that that it doesn't really affect things presently, and that sea lamprey are under control, and that we have fish in the Great Lakes. Uh, we can catch fish. You know, commercial fishermen are are catching fish again, and sport angling. Uh, you know, we still have have charter fishing and all those kinds of things in the Great Lakes. However, uh, sea lamprey control is still very much uh, in operation. Uh, people still go out and check streams for sea lamprey larvae, and then where they find sea lamprey larvae, they still uh, apply the lampricide to control those sea lamprey. So uh, the Great Lakes Fishery Commission decided that they wanted to get that story out and, and, and make people aware of it. Uh, the, especially for for new generations, for younger people who who don't remember the sea lamprey story and what it was like and the kind of devastation that it caused for fish. So um, basically, the 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 fishery commission decided they wanted to do an oral history project, where they were going to find everyone that they could who was involved in the original story, and then uh, see if they could be located, and then if they could record their their story. So. Uh, the Fishery Commission hired a graduate student, Corey Brandt. He, he was a postgrad at that point. He's a PhD. And uh, but Corey had uh, done a lot of his master's work and also some of his PhD work uh, at uh, the Hammond Bay Laboratory, uh, which is where they did the original research into ways to control sea lamprey. The Hammond Bay Laboratory is located on Hammond Bay, just uh, north of Roger City, Michigan, on the Lake Huron shore. So Corey, uh, once they hired Corey, he went around and, and just did a, a, an amazing job of researching where people who are involved with, in the story are currently and who might be available for us to talk to. So once Corey did his research, I was brought in to work with him to kind of identify who would be a key people to include in a, in a documentary film. And then we started traveling around and, and recording the, their stories. And uh, it, when you see the film, you'll see that uh, the first page of the credits is an in memoriam of people who appear in the film who have since passed away. So uh, a, a, key, a key objective of this project was to get those stories down to create an, an oral history. Corey did a lot of uh, video recording on his own with a small video camera and was able to record interviews with, with a lot of people who don't appear in The Fish Thief. But uh, those, those, uh, those interviews are part of an oral history archive that is, that is going to be at the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, along with all of the assets that we ac accumulated for uh, you know, shooting things. We created computer animation. We, we accumulated a lot of, in, uh, of archival images, both moving images images and still photography. And so those things are going to be at the Great Lakes Fishery Commission in an archive for other scholars and, uh, and historians uh, in perpetuity to be able to, to investigate more about this story. So um, the, the, the story begins with uh, talking about the history of Great Lakes fishing. Uh, this was potentially kind of a, a controversial aspect of the story because the Great Lakes Fishery Commission and a lot of people who work on sea lamprey wanted the, the, the story to be about sea lamprey. They, they saw sea lamprey as being the main, main character of this film. I disagreed with that as somebody who doesn't work with sea lamprey every day and is a, is a non-scientist. I felt that the star, star of this show was Great Lakes Fishing. And so... Uh, I felt that people wouldn't care much about sea lamprey if they didn't care about Great Lakes fishing. And so the, 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 we begin the story with with looking at how how fishing has been an, an integral part of people's lives in the Great Lakes region since prehistory. We we start off with indigenous communities and, and how they fished. And then we get into the emergence of commercial fishing and the emergence of sport fishing and the economic importance of, of fishing in the Great Lakes region. Uh, it, that history includes a number of fishery crashes that I wasn't really aware of until I started making this film. And uh, th there's a chain of fishery crashes that parallels the crash of other resources, natural resources in the Great Lakes region. Uh, many of you may know that the Great Lakes region, uh, an, an early industry was was white pine harvesting. The white pine fish, uh, the white the white pine forestry. Uh, White pine naturally covered the Great Lakes region, 
and eventually they were all cut down all the way across the Great Lakes region, uh, leaving the leaving clear cuts and and uh, small towns that had been built uh, around sawmills and those kinds of uh, uh, that kind of infrastructure for for forestry. Those towns were out of business, basically. And so what were they going to do next? Uh, and commercial fishing came in as, as something that that uh, that rescued a lot of those small towns. Uh, they were able to catch fish that su supplied the the wave of immigrants who came in for to work in the factories and in the steel mills and the things that were involved with industrialization. So commercial fishing became a, a big industry, but it also led to some fishery crashes. First in uh, in Lake Ontario with the San with the Atlantic salmon crash, basically commercial fishing and habitat destruction in Lake Ontario destroyed the, the natural uh, population of Atlantic salmon that uh, had migrated in from the Atlantic Ocean. Next came uh, Lake Erie, which had a, a massive uh, lake herring population. Overfishing basically destroyed that fishery as well. And so uh, those two fisheries were, those fishery crashes were, were attributed to overfishing as well as to habitat destruction, to the building of dams on tributary rivers uh, in, in the case of uh, Lake Ontario, but also uh, in Lake Erie, it was to the pollution that happened. Uh, the Great Lakes industrialization had a history of building all kinds of industrial facilities on lake shores and on riverbanks that uh, deposited their, their waste directly into waterways that polluted uh that polluted the waterways and made them uninhabitable for for many fish also in the case of the detroit river for instance they uh, the the reason why detroit is where it is is because it's where whitefish all came to spawn in in massive numbers and indigenous communities went there to fish for those whitefish when they came into the river from Lake Erie and uh, and sometimes Lake Huron to to uh, to reproduce on the rocky bottoms of the Detroit River. Well, the, well, when industrialization happened, they just they blasted that those rocky substrates out to create a shipping channel, destroying much of the the uh, whitefish spawning grounds there and whitefish stopped coming there to spawn for about a century. Um, that plus the pollution of the rivers, you know, you had the Cuyahoga River that caught on fire, you had the Rouge River that caught on fire. Uh, all of that pollution and that habitat destruction basically destroyed uh, a lot of uh, fish populations, destroyed their spawning grounds, and then overfishing in Lake Erie and Lake and Lake. Uh, Ontario basically destroyed the, the foundational fisheries of Great Lakes commercial fishing. But then all of a sudden fish started to disappear in Lake Huron and Lake Michigan, where there aren't so many dams on the rivers and where there aren't so many industrial facilities up in those in those areas. And so people wondered what was going on up there. Why were these why were fish, why were lake trout, especially in Lake Huron, starting to disappear? And the the initial assumption was that it was it was uh, overfishing, that too many people were were fishing more advanced gear. People were using uh, steam trawlers and steam lifters uh, instead of you know the fishing industry started off with sailing vessels and with nets that were more that were pulled up you know that were lifted by hand. Uh, but with industrialization came the industrialization of the fishing industry, where all of a sudden you have uh, steam tugs and you have steam lifters pulling larger and larger gill nets out of the water. So originally people thought that uh, that uh, what was happening in Lake Huron, when, when those fish started to disappear, that it was a repeat of the overfishing problems that happened in Lake Ontario and Lake Erie, but um, it just didn't add up. So with the fishery crash of, of Lake Erie, uh, the U.S. Fishery Service uh, opened a laboratory in Ann Arbor, Michigan. It was the first federal fisheries lab in the Great Lakes, and it was founded by, a, it, the first director was a gentleman named, uh, a fisheries biologist named John Van Oosten, and uh, he was a, a well-recognized fishery biologist, and he started looking into why were these fish disappearing? Was it because... Uh, of pollution was it because of overfishing? All these various kinds of things. He started, he started uh, doing research into f the original large-scale research into Great Lakes fisheries issues, and 
it, as uh, Jennifer Reed, who was the head of the U.S. or who was head of the, the University of Michigan Water Center, she's in the film, and basically she makes the point that that the U.S. Bureau of Fisheries made this this investment into fisheries biology because of the economic losses. It wasn't because of a, a curiosity about ecosystem management or about the the fishery populations and the health of the fisheries populations. What spurred this financial investment into into Great Lakes fishery science was the loss of economic resources. And so uh, it, as that research went on, uh, they started looking at what was going on in Lake Huron, and they weren't finding answers until all of a sudden some strange event occurred where some young kids walked up a, a trail on the Akiak River outside of Rogers City, Michigan, uh, I don't know if you know that river, but there is a waterfall there that's kind of uh, popular with people in that area, and it's a it's a popular swimming hole. Well, some kids in uh, in the nineteen I believe it was the nineteen forties walked up uh, to that uh, fishing hole and all of a sudden found uh, it was teeming with this squirming, slithering uh, mass of things they didn't know what it was, and they talked to some conservation officers and. Uh, and word got back to John Van Oosten about it. And basically that was the first time that sea lamprey had really been uh, on the radar of anybody uh, in fishery science in, in the Great Lakes. There were previous sightings. The first sea lamprey above Niagara Falls was was uh, sighted in 1921, I believe it was. Uh, November 8th, 1921, it was when uh, a fisherman in Lake Erie found the first sea lamprey on a whitefish uh, above Niagara Falls. And so nobody thought much about it. Uh, th they didn't really become a problem until uh, until the Akiak River sighting. So so anyway, our film goes on and tells the, tells the story about how, how sea lamprey surprised fisheries biologists. This was the first time that invasive species really became a concern in the Great Lakes. And as, as our previous presenters here have have shown uh, we've uh, we've uh, experienced a whole lot of other subsequent invasive species invasions that have have put invasive species continue to be on the map. The, the, the thing about the the sea lamprey story though is that it's a success story. Uh, it's sea lamprey through the through the efforts of government and science, uh, ways to control sea lamprey were found. It, it was a long, arduous fight uh, that was that was uh, that was conducted by pe very tenacious, very dedicated, and very stubborn people who uh, who uh, went after this this challenge to be able to to control sea lamprey. But in the end, it, it's been successful to the point that uh, sea lamprey are under control. The original objective was to was to eradicate sea lamprey, but that hasn't happened yet. And that's a big part of the story that, that uh, we're trying to get across in this film is that sea lamprey control is is something that's going to have to go on in, in perpetuity. Fortunately, uh, through the efforts of the scientists that were involved with this, they've come up with a solution that that has not harmed anyone. People have been using the, the chemical, the lampricide that they use to treat sea lamprey larvae in streams. They've been using it for almost 70 years, but no one who's worked with the chemical has gotten sick. Uh, animals that drink from those streams where they use the lampricide uh, largely haven't been affected by it. Um, uh, wildlife haven't been affected by it. People who fish, who swim, who, who uh, eat fish out of those rivers, aren't affected, haven't been affected by it. So it's a it's a surprising, a surprisingly happy ending to this story and a surprising uh just needle in a haystack story of how they found this this benign chemical that's that's so selectively toxic to sea lamprey uh, that that have allowed fish to to uh to flourish in the Great Lakes and and fisheries of both sport fisheries and commercial fisheries to, to continue to exist in the Great Lakes, to the point that we have uh, people from the National Wildlife Federation, the World Wildlife, uh, World Wildlife Fund talking about how beneficial sea lamprey control has been and how uh, it hasn't been the, any kind of environmental disaster or hasn't been an environmental threat to, to people. So having their testimony is, you know, was one of the things that I was really after. And, and, 
it's it's an important point that's there for people to to understand about Great Lakes sea lamprey control. So um, going forward, uh, hopefully we will be able to find some kind of a thing to control zebra mussels and quagga mussels and and uh, perhaps other invasive species that come into the Great Lakes. However, the the vectors by which sea lamprey entered the Great Lakes and other invasive species such as alewives have entered the, the Great Lakes, those those vectors are still open. And so there hasn't been the political will to close those vectors and and come up with ways of stopping invasive species from getting into the Great Lakes. And those are those those are debates that uh, still need to to continue on. But uh, what what the, the sea lamprey control stories has proven, though, is that science and government can, have been able to find solutions to these kinds of problems. And hopefully maybe in the future, we could we could do that again. So um, if I could take any questions from anybody, I'd be happy to do so. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, so we do have a question just about how and where the film continues to be on tour. Um, I know after it aired with us in Harbor Springs, it was in Sheboygan. Is there a place that we can find um, a current calendar? <laughs> yes. Well, right now I'm in I'm in Ely, Minnesota. We did a screening here. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm I'm leaving from here to go to Marquette. We're going to be in the Fresh Coast Film Festival in Marquette. Uh, this I believe we're screening uh, Friday and Saturday in, in Marquette. Then we're going to be in the Windsor International Film Festival down in Windsor, Ontario. So right now we're doing uh, screenings like we we did. We had a great screening with with the tip of the Mid Watershed Council in uh, in Harbor Springs, and uh, we're arranging more screenings that are going to be going on. I think we're going to be at the Cranbrook Institute in uh, in Birmingham, Michigan, uh, in early November. Uh, we're working on uh, streaming opportunities right now. Uh, it looks like we're going to be starting screen streaming sometime in December, and uh, we'll be making announcements about that press releases and everything be and we'll be sure to let uh, the tip of the watershed okay. council know so okay. you can inform your membership that's great that's great uh is there a website or something that um cali can put in the chat so folks can track your track your calendar uh the great lakes fishery commission glfc.org they have some social media up about uh, where the film is going oh great and then the fish is the is the project website but we don't have any of that kind of social media stuff up there right now with, with okay. things, but that that's in the works so okay but yeah if people can make it up to marquette for the fresh coast film festival i would just encourage that it's a great weekend and a fun place to be um, any other questions? I think that was it for right now. The information's great. Um, the film is great. And um, thank you for sharing the story and um, and I hope folks can catch it somewhere. But yeah, we'll um, we'll share some streaming information as soon as you have it too, because that would be that'd be great for folks to be able to catch it that way. Sounds good. That sounds great. Thanks for having yeah. me today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so now we are going to move on to um, last, but certainly not least, uh, to Arlene Westhoven. Um, she is a loon ranger for the Michigan Loon Preservation Association, and she is going to share with us all of the fabulous things that the Loon Preservation Association does and, um, and what it's like to be a loon ranger. So Arlene, um, if you can turn your camera back on, or no, that's going to be... Arlene can turn her camera back on and show us all the things. And I know it should be good to go. Okay, good morning, everybody. As you can see, I'm a loon ranger. I have my loon shirt on. Let's see, are we seeing this? I'm not seeing me, that's okay. <laughs> um, okay, so... Uh, the first slide, let's start with that, and we can look at that while I'm talking. Can we share screen? I Thanks to Kala for helping me get this together. It was a huge learning experience for me. So can we share the screen? Yes, the, the slideshow should be shared. Okay, so the first slide after this one. Okay, so um, Michigan Loon Preservation was formed uh, probably coming up on 60 years ago or more 
as part of uh, the Nature Conservancy and the Michigan Department of Natural Resources to, it's actually citizen science. Um, to protect the habit, to protect the, the common loon, uh, their habitat and its um, nesting and breeding success in Michigan. And to do this, we uh, organized uh, on lakes with loon history, uh, a loon ranger on each lake, and uh, an area coordinator that was reachable um, in maybe it covered uh, several uh, counties in Michigan, uh, and then a state coordinator that coordinated the whole event. I was the first state coordinator. Uh, I handed over the job to uh, Joanne Williams, and now it's uh, Melissa Jorgensen. So uh, the purpose was to protect the loon through education, habitat preservation, and uh, problem solving at the local level. Um, and so uh, the, the life history of the loon is that it is a northern bird. It doesn't go any further south than the Gulf of Mexico. And there are five species of common of loons. The common loon is the one we deal with. And occasionally uh, the red-throated loon and uh, the yellow-billed loon. There are also a Pacific loon, which is west of us, and the Arctic loon, which is north of us. And uh, it's, it is an indicator species of good water quality. And we cover the, all of Michigan, upper and lower peninsula, the, the southerly most nesting pair of loons that we have uh, and possibly in the world is in Berrien County, Michigan. Um, and uh, there were loons throughout the lakes in Michigan and all across the northern states here, but uh, habitat, habitat loss, uh, human development reduced their numbers. And it was a, a great concern um, for several reasons, um, which I'll, I'll go into well briefly. Uh, one of them was um, uh, commercial fishing botulism, uh, habitat loss due to uh, development and disturbance from watercraft, uh, among other things. So going through the, the life cycle of the loon, uh, loons uh, build a nest on water close to the shoreline, um, but uh, separated from the shoreline to keep away land predators, such as raccoons, feral cats. Well, they're not gonna go out in the water, so that deters that. Dogs, uh, there are aerial predators such as uh, eagles. Uh, so the loons and the biggest problem is us and uh, our, our activities as far as loons go. Loons require uh, undisturbed lakes, good fish source, uh, clean water. So here on the, the left, you see a picture of an adult loon and a chick, and the chick is downy, uh, and that means it's not able to dive yet, and throughout most of its development, it will continue to be fed by both parents. Uh, the slide on the right, it shows a loon diving. They can dive to great depths. Uh, and sometimes they, people say they could stay underwater for five or 10 minutes. That's because they actually fly underwater and they can cover a large distance. 
Uh, they are diving birds. They have solid bones. Uh, they're able to compress the air out of their feathers. Um, and they have what's called the uh, diving mechanism, which allows them to shut off their breathing and conserve oxygen uh, so they can continue to survive underwater uh, maybe a minute or two, but they can go a long distance in that, in that way. So let's have the next couple of slides. Okay, so here is the common uh, loon uh, with two chicks. Probably uh, the loon, uh, it takes about 28 days for the eggs to hatch. They lay two eggs and uh, hatch two chicks. And that's it for the season. So they guard those chicks carefully from underwater predators like snapping turtles and large fish. And loons do feed on fish. Uh, they love fish hatcheries, which people that work in fisheries uh, don't like. But um, plant enough fish so you can feed the loons too. Um, Eventually, they, the, the birds and the chicks hang around the nest until the chicks are able to go out into the water. At about two or three weeks, they develop, start to develop feathers, and then they are uh, able to dive. When they're downy, they often ride on the adult's back. I think I have a slide of that. That might be the next one. They're able to ride on the duck's back, which offers uh, protection from getting wet and uh, from offers them protection from underwater predators. And why do they do this? Anybody have an answer? The reason they do it, it's cute, so that we will protect them. And it really is a neat sight. Uh, throughout the summer, the adults will uh, feed the birds and teach them, uh, let them dive. Uh, it takes all summer to do this, and both adults feed the birds, the chicks. And as summer goes on, the chicks then uh, practice diving and feeding themselves, but the adults stay with them. Uh, toward fall, we have the flying lessons. And you'll see um, chicks diving more often, feeding themselves more often. And uh, I live uh, right on Grand Traverse Bay in Michigan. And near me uh, is the uh, chain of lakes about which this uh, group is talking. And uh, so I can go a few miles inland and see 14 pairs of loons scattered on our lakes and stream. They don't nest on streams, but I can, I can visit throughout the summer these 14 uh, pairs of loons that are, are very productive. Uh, two chicks is what they have. Uh, sometimes they can't feed both chicks. They will selectively feed the healthy one and let the other one uh, and forage for itself and hope it makes it so. Um, and many of our pairs do, may, do produce the two chicks. And that's a sign that the lakes in this watershed are healthy. So let's see what the next slide holds. Okay, here is, um, a, here is a pair of adult loons feeding a, an older chick. So you can see they're like uh, teenagers that don't want to leave home as long as mom and dad feed them. But the, the one on the left is an older chick and it, you can see that it's almost uh, getting the plumage of the adult. It won't get that plumage uh, until, until it, renew, it returns to the nesting area. So here's what happens as fall comes, uh, the chicks now are successful. The successful chicks will feed and dive and, and are able to fly. And the adults will leave first. 
and fly down to either the Gulf of Mexico or the Atlantic coast, uh, not much further than the Florida panhandle. And they are ocean birds. Um, and so the chick will not reach its breeding age until it's about four years of old, four years old. And so it's a long time before the the chicks come back uh, and they come back to the same area to breed, but their adults won't leave, won't let them back on the lake because they've got their established territory on the lake. It takes about 30 acres to support one pair of loons and their chicks. And so the kids have to find another place to nest. And that's where our association comes in uh, to preserve enough habitat on lakes so that the, the chicks will find a place when they come back to the breeding area. And let's see what the next slide holds. Okay, so uh, with that history, uh, loons are strictly northern birds. Um, loons cannot walk on land. So sometimes uh, somebody will report to us that we have a, a bird that is beached and injured. Most likely, if if uh, the best scenario is that it just got stuck up on the beach and can't get back down to the water. Uh, we do have uh, a few pairs that do travel some distance, but the, the, the structure of the body of the loons is that um, their feet are at the rear. This enables them to stand up, but they're so heavy that they flop forward. So in order to move across land, they are, are like a seal. And they kind of hunch along, and it puts them in a dangerous position for predators. And so they spend their entire life on water unless something happens to them. As soon as the chicks are hatched and kind of fluffed up, they leave the nest and they don't go back to the nest again, except to breed. So um, they're strictly water birds and you might compare them to um, penguins. Uh, penguins also have uh, solid bones, which means that they are divers, just like loons. Um, so um, loons are the northern birds, um, and they're up here for probably seven or eight months in, in northern Michigan and uh, the UP. So our association uh, has formed several, it has several areas. Uh, um, I happen to be in the Grand Traverse area. We have uh, some all over the state and in the UP, and the goal of our organization is to make contact lo as locally as possible to get help to the loons. So we've already mentioned uh, several problem problems that would affect loons. So here we have our um, loon sign, uh, one of our lake associations, the Intermediate Lake Association, uh, designed this sign and gave us permission to use it. And so here are some of the problems listed. Uh, stay away from loons with watercraft. And you can see up here at the top, you can see the loon nest island, um, the loon sitting on the nest, that's a natural nest. We do construct artificial nests, which uh, I have a slide. And in the middle of this um, poster or sign, uh, there's a loon with a chick on the back. And at the bottom, we see the, 
the signal that you are too close, that something is threatening the loons. We often think that it's, it's accompanied by the loon call, the tremolo, <laughs> and loud flapping. That's not a happy call. That means something is too close. And it's alarm call, and you should move away. So loons are threatened in Michigan. Uh, it is illegal to harass a loon by chasing it. Um, pretty serious penalty. Uh, one of the problems is with uh, abandoned fishing tackle and tackle in general is the lead. Lead tackle, uh, a bird, being a fish eating bird, a loon will take, uh, take a lure and get a piece of lead which goes into its um, gizzard and breaks down and a, a, a sinker will kill a loon within a week. Uh, and, or weaken it to the point where it will develop a susceptibility to aspergillosis, which is a fungal infection. Uh, birds have air sacs, they don't have lungs like we do. So uh, they're, an infection like that could spread throughout their entire respiratory system. <clears throat> and so um, this uh, sign provides a, a contact. It's not a local contact. That 800 number is the Michigan DNR number. But underneath it on the sign, it's the Lone Ranger can write a contact number right there. So if somebody on the lake sees something, a problem with a loon, they can look down here and they can find the contact on that lake to notify so we can get on it right away. So let's see what the next slide brings. Okay, so here's a situation. Uh, it's kind of unclear, which is okay, because but you can see down to the right a loon being released into the water. And here's here's our loon ranger, uh, Dan Lantis from Fife Lake. Uh, this was a call about a loon landing on a wet road, thinking it was water, and the loon couldn't move. So I called Dan the ranger and I said, I've "Got a loon up here on the, on the highway." And he went uh, with a friend. And when you're transporting a loon, you need to support its weight because uh, all the organs, if it's on something solid, are very sensitive to pressure. So Dan had his little collection basket ready and he released the loon uh, into the water and it was okay. It just, it was not injured. It was just beached and it could not move. So the indication when a loon is up on land, it may be injured, in which case we need to get capture it and get it to a veterinarian to be checked. Uh, or the first suggestion is to take it to a larger body of water and re release it and see if it swims. And this turned out very well. So let's see what the next slide brings. Okay, well, we'll wait on this one um, until the end. So I'm going to uh, list the um, threats to loons that we have, and we've already mentioned many of them. Um, So the, one of the threats is habitat loss. And uh, loons require uh, clean water, uh, a safe area to nest, and that means a nest off the, off the, um, off the shoreline. And we have, let's go to the next slide and let's see what we've got here. 
Do we have a picture of a nest? Okay, let's try. Oh, I thought I sent you a picture of a nest. Um, I don't think I okay. got that one, unfortunately. Pardon? I don't think I got that one, unfortunately. Oh, yeah, we had some trouble. Well, uh, the nest islands, um, you can see the contact for our, our association. Um, this is the Facebook con contact. Um, and this is an area where it lists, uh, you can ask questions of our Facebook coordinator and she will distribute those to the appropriate people. So uh, one of the things we do to provide nesting uh, habitat is to build nest island platforms. And the, these are five by five uh, square structures. We've been building them out of PVC pipe and putting nesting material on top. And uh, that can consist of uh, straw. And, but some people actually plant gardens with, um, uh, they put, uh, they use uh, netting, PVC netting, you know, the stuff that they use for, it's that orange stuff. Um, and the idea is that this floating island, the loons have to be get have to be able to get up on it. So some people even build ramps. And there are plans for this on our website. And uh, it is suggested that people don't just go out and put loon nest islands out. Uh, because if there's a second pair that comes to a lake, uh, the Loon Ranger has to assess the lake to see if it's even makes sense for another another pair to be on the lake. And we did have one incident like this where they put a second nest island out and the first pair defended its original territory and the second pair never did use the nest the second nest island. It's they both spent so much fighting over the appropriate area that nobody had any chicks. So um, uh, these nest islands need to be uh, permitted and uh, uh, and the warning buoys, which we have available, uh, there have to be placed. They cannot say, uh, you cannot bring your boat here, but they just give the warning that this is a loon nesting area. And we take the platforms out after the season to discourage other uh, birds, which can be competitors from using this nest. So, the, so preserving and providing good nesting area is one of our goals. Uh, I already mentioned, um, I guess Cala didn't get my, uh, example of the the loon with with lead not only ingested lead but the line was wrapped around its leg and its wings so it was unable to dive or fly and we did not find this bird in time to rescue it uh, rescue uh, is it's complicated it's best done at night and um, with at least the least disturbance, uh, a loon that can dive is almost impossible to rescue. Uh, it's best uh, if you have a loon in trouble to contact the loon ranger on the lake and find out what to do about that. Lead is a big problem uh, as well as fishing line. Uh, the other problem that is uh, happening is that we have birds that are um, disturbed as well as shoreline by boat traffic. Primarily, uh, up until recently, the main disturbance was personal watercraft because they can get into areas where loons are likely to nest. 
and cause uh, noise and a uh, wave disturbance. But wake boats are a large problem for loons, not only because they, they allow the nesting area to get flooded because of the wake, that's what they're called, they're called wake boats, and the nest gets flooded um, or tipped so that the eggs roll off. And uh, lake so we work a lot with lake associations. In fact, they are our best ally as far as protecting loons on a particular lake. Because if you protect the loons, you're protecting the property and the water quality of the lake. And um, uh, so wake boats uh, are a problem. Uh, Michigan Lakes and Streams Association is very concerned about this. It's so contact with them is, is recommended. Another pollution extreme, which occurred a few years ago that's related to all of these issues that, that you talked about is eutrophication. Because if there's no oxygen left in the water, the only thing that can grow is something that doesn't need oxygen and that's botulism. And we had a large die off of all, all water birds uh, in Grand Traverse Bay and Lake Michigan um, several years ago. And there were dead loons as well as um, many other birds that we found along the shoreline dead because of the zebra mussels eating themselves out of house and home. That's what I call it. Uh, and they died and then the algae took over. Uh, the, and so uh, botulism is, has not been a problem on the inland lakes. Uh, going back to the lead, the lead also affects other organisms because uh, birds that catch fish that um, have lead, the lead affects the fish's ability to swim and they float. So eagles and gulls will take the take the fish and that goes right up the food, the food web. Um, I have our Facebook page here. If you've got a pencil, it's uh, we have a, a website, www.michiganloons.org. I will give you my email. It's our loon. 43 at gmail.com. And my phone number is 231-598-0878. So we'll provide that at some point if possible. I appreciate the, the um, opportunity to make this preservation presentation to you in uh, light of preserving loons and our water quality. And I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thanks, Arlene. Um, and I put the, um, your, the Michigan Loons website um, link in the chat for everyone as well. Um, there was a question about where someone could get that loon sign. Um, perhaps to post, um, you know, to get for their for themselves or for their own lake association or something. So maybe that's a contact to you directly, or is there a, another another way to do that? Well, I um, I guess I'm in charge of the signs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, we do charge for them. Mm -hmm. So we can get more made up. They are waterproof. Um, they, um, uh, it is a good idea to double check, uh, unless you're putting in, uh, if you're going to put it up at a DNR launch site, uh, you need to double check with a DNR to make sure it's okay to post that there. 
Right. Good point. So, so make sure you are allowed to post the sign where you want to post the sign and then get a hold of Arlene to to get that sign, um, get get that sign in your possession. Yes. And okay. I, I will do you, did you get my can you put my um uh Email down, that's the best way. Yeah, to do it. I think Kelly can do that because she's got that since she's been communicating with you. So she'll get that in the chat. Right. For but you have my yeah. email once she can she can post that. Yeah. And, um, and then, then I had a, I had a here, question, here. Arlene. How would someone know who or how to get a hold of a loon ranger? Well, like, um, where you live. You, you can uh, look at our website. Okay. Um, or the or the Facebook. Okay. Because somebody's monitoring that Facebook page. Okay. That makes okay. sense. And then I have another favor to ask since we're in this area. We used to have an area coordinator and in, in uh in the uh watershed area. His name was Jeff Lang. And he covered um, he covered uh, Emmett, Sheboygan, Montmorency, the that whole uh, northern area. Well, that's a big area, okay. And um, he has since passed away, so we don't have an area coordinator for that that area. So again, so they would they would need to contact uh, me or the. The website contact me by email and we need loon rangers on Burt lake black lake pickerel lake and walloon lake got it okay walloon, and that, Burt lake black lake and pickerel lake yep and walloon yep and if people call for signs um I, if they're in my area, which is north of Traverse City, south of Charlevoix, I can deliver them at some point. Uh, you would want to wait to put that sign out until next spring. So, okay. Some time. And then we and had a question. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. So we have a question about the cost of permitting for a nest and then the cost of the sign. Well, the sign we've been charging um, $25. Okay. Which covers the cost. Uh, and if I have to mail it, it, you know, it adds a little bit. Um, okay, the permitting, uh, you would also contact, um, uh, the person to contact is, I don't, I thought, you ha we have to find out if, who the local DNR person is, the local so DNR a, office. So that's a DNR permit. So that would be, so that depends on permitting through DNR. Yes. Okay. And, um, the reason we tell you the Lake Association people uh, is that they can, um, they know the people on the lake. And so a lot of the problems can be taken care of right on the lake uh, quickly. So um, that finding out who that person is would would be contacting me or the state coordinator, Melissa, and all that information is on the website and Facebook. You can contact our Facebook site. Um, and let's see, any other questions? Nope, that's it. I think most of the stuff can be answered on your website. So yeah, on my website, or you can you can email me. It'll keep me off. off uh, and we do have these brochures. Uh, here's the one, lead poisoning and loons. Um, lead poisoning and loons and safe watercraft use. OK. So, so that's available and I'll be looking forward to talking to you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Absolutely. Thanks, Arlene.
Um, I want to let everyone um, go relatively on time and be respectful of everyone's time and get you out for the afternoon. I have two announcements um, on behalf of the Watershed Council. Keep your eyes peeled for our icebreakers. That's our winter um, uh, presentation speaker series. We are doing them um, this year, well, in 2025, this season, this winter season. We are going to do three. We're going to do one uh, per month, and they will be um, in person and, and streamed um, as a webinar. So you can join in person, live, or watch them online. Um, there will be one in January, February, and March each. And then we're also going to, of course, host um, Linking Lakes again um, next spring. That will become our annual gathering for Lake Association members, everyone um, also just interested in um, the management, stewardship, and use and enjoyment of inland lakes here in the Tip of the Mitt region. Um, so stay tuned for you know, registration information and agendas um, for that. That's just the excellent opportunity to get together, um, meet with everyone who's involved in management of inland lakes um, and hear some presentations on what's happening um, in Northern Michigan um, around um, inland lakes and our watershed management there. So um, that's all I have. And any other last questions for any of the other um, presentations that we heard this morning, um, answer them now, or you can um, contact us for them. I